Hello! Welcome to another edition of the PFAS video series with Simon. Today we're starting a little mini series inside this PFAS series called Three Things Everyone Needs to Know About PFAS. Today will be part one. I also have some other videos that I did on PFAS nomenclature and history. I really recommend the history one just because uh, a lot of that stuff will come up again and again and again uh, when I'm talking and I find the history interesting. I'm a little bit of a history nerd. But today, part one of the three things everyone needs to know about PFAS is persistence. Persistence is key importance here in talking about PFAS as an environmental issue. Persistence, simply, how long will a compound remain in the environment? There's lots of different variations of this definition. How long will a compound remain unchanged in the environment? Um, there's time definitions of this. So what's persistent? Is it one day, one year, 10 years, a thousand years? When PFAS came along, PFAS changed the rules of what persistent really means. So PFAS, by definition, they're designed to be inert, stable, and non-reactive for the applications they're used in. For example, if you have a firefighting foam, you don't want that foam to degrade. You don't want it to go away. If you have waterproof treatment on things, you don't want that, you don't want to lose that waterproof over time. If you've treated cookware, you don't want that uh, to degrade and go into food. It, I, I could go on and on about all the reasons why persistence is a good thing for PFAS as industrial chemicals. It, it is a really good thing. But the um, paradigm here is that the more inert and stable and non-reactive things are for their application, the more persistent they'll be in the environment. They don't break down during use. They're not going to break down after release and during um, disposal. So when I was digging around for some information on PFAS persistence, I uh, found an old book, because again, I like old books. This is a book from 1950 by Joseph Simons, uh, the inventor of the um, electrofluorination method, so the um, ECF, electrochemical fluorination. He worked with 3M in the early days to get them going with their first synthesis. He said that PFAS have the hearts of diamonds and the skins of rhinoceros hides. I, as I came across that, just thought it was a really good quote. Uh, so I made my own contribution to science here. phosphorus because it is a PFOS with its skin of rhinoceros hide. I didn't work in the diamonds, but the diamonds really are those little carbon atoms kind of tucked away in the body of that rhinoceros. So that's our phosphorus today. We'll be talking about it. Phosphorus is a mythical animal. It's a magical, just like a well-armored unicorn. Um, so what I'll be talking about is what gives the phosphorus its magical abilities. And so here you go. That's all you need to know is this equation. This describes all its magical abilities. But since it's a little tricky to understand, um, I don't know if I fully understand it. I'll give you the context here. 1932, Linus Pauling, very famous researcher. He uh, won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this work and other work and won a Nobel Peace Prize after that. So he won two. Uh, overachiever, huh, Linus? But uh, Linus did great work. He was the sort of founder of modern bond theory, talking about how electronegativity decreases, describes the bond strength. Um, differences in electronegativity, that's kind of what that equation means between two atoms, um, can describe how strong the bond is in different ways. And anytime you're seeing Linus Pauling, you'll probably see this next, yeah, this chart of electronegativity. Um, and if you zoom in on this chart, you'll see at the top right, fluorine kind of stands out because it's got the highest number. Um, it's got the highest uh, electronegativity on that Pauling scale. And what that means is when you bond fluorine with something like carbon that has less electronegativity, um, that bond takes a lot more energy to break. And that's the values that I have listed there are the bond energies. So you can see a carbon to carbon bond versus a carbon to fluorine bond, there's much different bond energies. Same with the carbon hydrogen and the carbon fluorine bond. That CF bond is one of the strongest bonds in organic chemistry. Um, that SIF bond is even stronger. Uh, that's interesting because before 
we knew about fluorochemicals and before we even really knew what fluorine and HF was, uh, glass makers and glass etchers were using HF to etch designs in glass. Um, they had found ways to purify it and found that it was really good at etching glass. That has to do with that affinity for that SIF bond. Uh, kind of interesting sidebar there. So this bond strength between the C and the F is one of the major factors that gives PFAS their persistence. It's a strong bond. It's just really hard to break down, especially under environmental conditions, especially under the conditions you would see just kind of um, out there at ambient conditions. But PFAS persistence is more than just the strength of the bond. If, if you go back to that chart that I was just at, um, that carbon to carbon bond, these PFAS molecules still have a lot of carbon to carbon bonds. So you might ask, well, I know the CF bond is very resistant to breakdown, but what about the CC bonds? Um, filling a, a molecule with fluorine, it does change the nature of the CC bond. In some cases, it will increase the bond energy. In some cases, it actually decreases. It's very, very interesting trends there. But there's a completely different um, topic to cover here with the persistence of PFAS, and that is the shape of the molecule and the arrangement of the atoms on the backbone. I'm going to look at some examples here. First example is octane sulfonate. This is a non-fluorinated molecule. This is a hydrocarbon with an SO3 group on the end. And when you can see those white balls, that is hydrogen, and the gray is carbon. And you can see the carbon's not well protected there. There's lots of room, what they call um, for oxidative attack. They call a attack on those carbons, um, which can break down the molecule. Um, this can happen chemical oxidation. This can happen in photolysis. Um, but that is kind of why our hydrocarbons break down relatively easy. And you know, they're not super easy to break down, but they do degrade in the environment. Um, if this was Goldilocks story, and this is how I think of these next three examples, uh, I would call this mama bear because when Goldilocks stumbled across this one, Goldilocks obviously was trying to develop um, some persistent inert compounds for her chemistry work. When she stumbled across this one, clearly found that it was too soft, too labile, um, didn't like it, it didn't really work for Goldilocks. So what Goldilocks did, of course, is try to, to try to find something else. So perchlorooctane sulfonate. This one, as far as I know, has never existed and will never exist. From what I've read, um, fully chlorinating a molecule like this would be impossible. These chlorine atoms, um, although the electronegativity is also high, that bond would be pretty strong they would not be able to arrange themselves in a stable conformation because there's too big, there's too many repulsive forces, they might say. Um, and you can see in the 3D model, there's not a whole lot of room um, for those chlorine atoms to squeeze in there. Um, this is one reason, you know, early chemists did try to make heavily chlorinated compounds for the same reason they tried to make heavily fluorinated uh, and they had difficulties and theoretically it makes sense. It's also one reason they kind of thought these long chain fluorocarbons were not possible in early days. It was kind of thought, you know, just like other halogens, we won't be able to create some long chain fluorocarbons. Um, so Goldilocks stumbled across, across this one. This is definitely Papa Bear's bed. This bed was too stiff, too rigid, not even possible to just break to pieces. So finally, of course, we have Baby Bear. This one's got to be the one that's just right. This is uh, perfluorooctane sulfonate, aka PFAS, aka one of the most common PFAS out there. And this has the perfect balance. Is it is it random luck? Kind of. That you know, it, it's theoretically we know that fluorine has those strong bonds, but just the fact that it would be the perfect shape to arrange itself around the carbon backbone so that it is very stable, it is structurally very stable, but it also is very protective. You can see in that little animation, there's not a lot of gaps between um, the fluorine. These are, that's the van der Waals kind of, you know, region plotted around the, the atoms in this. Um, so just keep looking at that spinning around. There's not a lot of room for attack of those carbon atoms. So that's really what gives PFAS a lot of their persistence is that nothing can get to the carbons. They're shielded, they're protected, they're 
Um, they're like little diamonds in that initial analogy. They're diamonds wrapped tightly in the fluorine, kind of packed together. So I think that's very interesting, um, and it explains most of the PFAS persistence if we're talking about you know, chemical degradation. But there is one more topic, and that would be biological degradation. Um, so for billions of years, things have evolved to be able to degrade compounds, either for energy or for detoxification, um, to be used as metabolites and intermediates. But fluorinated chemicals and these heavily perfluorinated chemicals have only been around since the 1930s. There hasn't been time evolutionarily compared to the three or four billion years we've had organic molecules to only have a few, um, you know, less than a hundred years worth of PFAS. The microbes out there just don't have the enzymes to break them down. That's not to say that there are no fluorinated, naturally fluorinated compounds out there because there are. Um, this is from a special issue of Chemosphere about naturally halogenated compounds and there were some really interesting articles in that. But uh, this paper showed two naturally fluorinated metabolites, that's a fluoroacetate and a fluorothreonine, like an amino acid. Um, very cool that that can happen in nature, but that remains very rare and that's kind of a special case and it's special enzymes to break the fluorine bond just it just doesn't need to exist in nature it never has so it doesn't there's been no evolutionary driver for that so covered those those three main reasons so we can go back to our pifosaurus um, so our mystical pifosaurus now we've kind of decoded its its magic its magic lies in that bond strength of the CF, it lies in the protection of the shape of the fluorine atoms, and it you know, involves the lack of microbial oxidation because the lack of naturally evolved enzymes. So we get resistance to things like UV degradation and photolysis that degrade some things, thermal degradation and heat-based degradation, uh, chemical and microbial oxidation. So we have a, we have a very well-protected P. phosphorus here. Unfortunately, P. phosphorus is not an endangered species. Since the 1930s, there's a lot of it out there. Um, so until we find a way to really break that skin, that will be a topic of a different video, is how do we get rid of these compounds? But uh, for now, P. phosphorus, he's pretty safe and pretty happy. And then lastly here, very important, when I say PFAS, I'm talking about a huge class of thousands and thousands of compounds, theoretically millions of different structures and combinations of functional groups. And when I say PFAS are persistent, clearly that's a broad generalization. Um, there are PFAS that would degrade just as fast as any other non-fluorinated compound just because of their inherent instability um, based on how they're designed. But one thing that we do see in the data with PFAS degradation is that PFAS compounds, the ones that do degrade, generally degrade to other PFAS compounds. So as a class, PFAS are persistent. We may be able, and you're seeing these days with Gen X, you're seeing compounds that are designed to break down more quickly in the environment because maybe they have uh, a more susceptible ether bond, something like that. Well, what they break down into is probably still perfluorinated and heavily fluorinated acids. That's just how it happens. So PFAS as a class are persistent. There are exceptions to compounds being specific, but they're all gonna to degrade to PFAS anyway. For the most part, there's exceptions to everything. So hopefully you've learned persistence of PFAS is the bond stability, it's the protection of the carbon-carbon bonds, and it's the lack of natural enzymes out there. That concludes three things everybody needs to know about PFAS part one. Hope you enjoyed. Here's some links to my other videos, and if you have questions, and if you have specific things you want to learn about PFAS, um, if you have corrections, because, you know, I, I try to put these citations, I read things as I understand them, uh, I may, I, there's a good chance I'm wrong about a lot of these things, and there's also a good chance I am oversimplifying some very complicated issues. Understand that, just trying to make something accessible and interesting, but absolutely put comments. If you need to clarify something I say, absolutely please do it. Um, and check out the other videos. Thanks and bye.